just wanted to say that uh, we're just delighted to be here with you. Uh, what a thrill it is to come and to be able to share with you some exciting things that, that Jesus is doing. You know, I, I should have told the pastor, just tell him I'm a nail on the wall. And we're going to hang the picture of Christ there. And that's what you're going to behold today. You're going to see some amazing things that, that God is doing. God is up to something special. Amen. He's up to something special. Uh, and as we go through this, uh, we're going to discover that. Uh, let me just say that we're going to be doing another program later on this evening. I'm sure it's not going to get started at 7, but that's okay. Uh, but we're going to look at a lot of evidence we're not going to take the time so much in this session to look at the evidence, but there's 32 years of accumulated evidence. And so we're going to look at a, uh, a summary of the evidence at, uh, whenever the evening program starts, the Vesper program, whatever. After each little segment, we'll talk about Noah's Ark, we'll talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, we'll talk about the Red Sea Crossing site, the Ark of the Covenant, the real, real Mount Sinai. We'll look at the evidence, and then we'll take a question and answer session. Do you have any questions? I mean, if nothing else, uh, this material creates a lot of questions that folks have. And so we want to give you an opportunity to ask a question, so that will be later. But for right now, we want to consider what is going on with uh, this material. Why are these things happening? What, what in the world is taking place here? Um, maybe you can sense that something special, something significant is really going on. Uh, that began back in 1977, 32 years ago, with uh, Brother Ron Wyatt. And so we'll be sharing what God began back then, the why. Okay? Now sometimes when you're too close to something, you ever hear the expression, you know, you can't see the forest for the trees? Sometimes when you're so close to it, you don't recognize exactly what's happening until you pull back and take a collective look. That's kind of what we're going to do this afternoon. There have been... Uh, several major archaeological sites that have been relocated over the last 32 years and have gained world notoriety. Um, of course, I've been involved for 22 years and as the director of the site and, and my wife uh, is the webmaster, we get all kinds of emails from folks all over the world. And this material is going around the globe. It's in Chinese, it's in Russian, it's in German, it's in every language. We find it, we get the emails from people in, in little islands out in the sea. So uh, God is doing something significant here. We're going to be talking about Noah's Ark, Sodom and Gomorrah, pyramids. How many realize that the pyramids on the Giza Plateau is a biblical site? You know, the word pyramid means fire measures or light measures. It's not even an Egyptian word. And, uh, but yet it's often, most often tied, scholars have tied it, historians have tied it to Egyptian culture and tradition. It's really a biblical site. You've got this crossing of the Red Sea that we're going to look at, the real Mount Sinai, the Ark of the Covenant, of course, which is probably one of the most controversial. Gethsemane and the Garden Tomb. Why are all of these archaeological sites emerging now in this generation? 20, 22, that's right. 22 years ago, when uh, my uh, queen and I w went to a, a uh, camp meeting, we were first exposed to the research. And we knew then what you all know today. And that is that these things have been searched for by thousands of people, literally for centuries. You're aware of that, right? You're aware that thousands of people, scholars, professors, explorers, world leaders, have been looking and searching for, for these sites for centuries. Why didn't they find them? It wasn't the time, was it? It wasn't the time. So we know that God is up to something significant. Thousands have been looking for these things, and they came up short with virtually no physical evidence. And of course, because of that, a lot of tradition developed. A lot of traditional ideas developed. Um, how many have heard that Noah's Ark is on top of Mount Ararat? That's tradition. The uh, cities of the plains, under the Dead Sea, We've heard all of these traditions. Mount Sinai in uh, the Sinai Peninsula. 
But you know what? All of that tradition was really kind of a blessing. You know, there are 12 different theories as to where the Ark of the Covenant is. All of that, in a way, was really a blessing. Because what it did, it preserved and protected the authentic locations until this hour when God would call them into service. So what's going on? What, what did God initiate with Ron Wyatt 32 years ago? What began then? What started to happen? Because anybody would say, wait a minute, no one man is going to go over on his vacation time and find virtually everything that every scholar has been looking for for centuries. They're going to say, that's humanly impossible. And they're right. But the word, the operative word, is humanly, isn't it? Because I think you can sense, and I think you'll know after this, that God is doing something incredible here. Because we know that with God, how many things are possible? All. All things are possible. So what's taking place is actually a supernatural event initiated by God directly. It's not possible outside of what God can do. So something else is going on. Now, there's been a lot of controversy concerning and surrounding these sites over the years. A lot of that has come within our own church. And I know that it uh, always uh, saddened Ron that the church would not embrace what he knew God had specifically given to his people. Ron knew that. Now, to help illustrate what's happening here, I want to give you a little test. You see there a collection of squares on the screen. I just want you to take a second. Tell me how many, how many squares you see collected there. How many are up there? Just real quick. Uh, let's see if you're right. Okay, how many, see, how many said 16? Well, there's more than 16. Well, there's more than 16. Who, who, has, who has another answer? Anybody have anything more? 17. 17. 21. 22. All right, let's take a look and see. You, you see what's obvious, right? Yeah, 21. Let's count them off. <laughs> We're still going, aren't we? 30 squares. Now, this is an important illustration. And it actually can be applied to your very, the way you think in your life, the work, in every aspect of your life and your thinking. When you saw what was obvious, do you know your mind said, I've got the answer. I'm satisfied that I have the answer. And your mind went on to something else. Okay, it was ready to go on to the next thing. But when you started looking a little bit deeper, when you started looking below the surface, you began to say, hey, there are other things below the surface. There are other things that aren't so obvious. Now that happens a lot in Bible study in general. In fact, if you were here yesterday evening with, uh, with Brother Lee Forbes, he was illustrating this very concept on learning how to study the Bible. You know, we read over scriptures and we don't really understand what they mean until we start to dig. It's important to dig, right? God, God lays lots of gems below the surface. Well, you know what? He's done the same thing with the discoveries. A lot of people just look at what's on the surface. And they say, oh, that couldn't be possible. You know, one guy finding all that, that's just absurd. You know, especially when Professor this so-and-so has been looking for this. And, and uh, there have been eyewitness sightings of uh, the ark up on Mount Ararat. And uh, you've heard it all before. Let's consider all 30 squares, all right? Let's consider 30 squares. <clears throat> what is really going on here? What is really happening here? Something beyond, beyond human intellect. Something beyond human initiative. Something special is going on here. One of the things that we noticed early on, was that all of the sites 
involves stone in some way. Now maybe that was one of those 16 squares that you may have noticed that everything involves stone in some way. Even the petrified remains of Noah's Ark, it's become a stone, a wooden ship that has fossilized. Now, that's an important observation, and here's why. It immediately, my mind went to Luke 19. And here is the story of Christ riding into Jerusalem. You're all familiar with it. It's called his triumphal entry. They did this every year. The priests would go outside to one of the sheepfolds and find the Paschal Lamb. And they, they would bring him back into the gates of the city through one of the gates, and the people had lined the street. And when, of course, the priest came in with the lamb, they would begin to shout, wave their palm branches, throw down their cloaks, so that the priest could pass over. It was a commemoration of the Passover. Now, you're familiar with the story. Jesus comes riding through as the ceremony begins, and what happens? The people began crying out, right? They began waving the palm branches, remembering his wonderful works, shouting and praising God, throwing down their cloaks for him to pass over. And what do the Pharisees do? They come hustling over real quick because Jesus is preempting the whole ceremony. Jesus, tell your disciples, tell the people to be quiet. And what does Jesus say? It's right here for us. Master, rebuke the disciples. And what does he say to them? I tell you that they should hold their peace. The stones would immediately cry out. What didn't the Pharisees recognize? Here, here they're waiting for the priest to bring the lamb and standing right in front of them is the priest and the lamb. They failed to recognize who he was. If the people had not responded such, the very stones would have cried out. So what's happening today? If the people had not cried out, if the people had not recognized and remember the mighty, wonderful works he had done. You see, what were they remembering? They were remembering all of the miracles Jesus had performed. And so they knew there was something special about this rabbi. You read through the Gospel of John, the first couple of chapters, and it says that Jesus performed miracles and that the people recognized who he was and they were drawn to him. Even, even a lot of the Pharisees, even though they weren't in the majority, so it was that physical evidence of the manifestation of God's power that drew them to him. If the people had been quiet, the stones would have cried out. Now, could this be what's happening today? Could God see that it's necessary for stones to be crying out today? Why would that be necessary? Maybe for the same reason? Maybe for the same reason? Maybe the people don't really recognize the, the urgency of the hour? Jesus described the condition of his church at the end. He, he said, wait a minute, the people at the end, the church at the end, is going to be lukewarm. Lukewarm. They're going to be indifferent to their calling. They're going to be distracted from their mission. Do, do we see this prevalent in the church today? And I think if we're honest with ourselves, you know, Paul says to us, examine yourselves whether you even be in the faith. It's time for self-examination, just like on the Day of Atonement, isn't it? Indifferent to their calling, distracted from their mission. He, Jesus goes on in the parable, Matthew 25, to tell us that all of the virgins slumbered and slept. Now let me ask you, how much praising do you do when you're sleeping? Who, who does praising when they're sleeping? Maybe some of you do. Okay. <laughs> some hands out there. But not much praising is done when you're sleeping, when you're slumbering, when you're drunk with the cares of this life, of this world. God, knowing that this would happen, planned for the initiative took the initiative, and he planned for this condition. Look, we just spent over an hour, an hour and a half, in a church service, 
where Johnny did a marvelous job in basically illustrating the enemy's plan and ramblings. The lies and the theories and all the things that take us and, and distract us away from God. And all the nonsense that's going on today. If, if you can't see that the enemy knows that he must gain control of your life, then you're blind. If you can't see it, you're blind. Now, that is one of the conditions of Laodicea. They are blind. But I'm telling you, if you, you need to open your eyes if you can't see it. The enemy is trying to take complete control of your life. He has no other option. He has no other choice. He must gain full control of the world. And he'll do that primarily through the financial aspect of things. But we sat and we watched that for an hour. All the things that the enemy was doing, all the things and ways that the enemy has lied and led people astray. Well, what's God doing? Is, is He sitting on the sidelines? No. Is He watching His team out there taking a pounding? <laughs> Since 1977, my friends, He has been in the game. He has been at the helm. He is the quarterback. Amen. He has taken charge. He's taken the reins into His own hands. And He said, you know what? I'm going to provi provide something for you. I'm going to provide you an asset. Maybe this is part of that gold tried in the fire along with the white raiment and the eye salve. A real asset to do what? What He's always wanted us to do. To bring the world to a point of decision. Wrap this whole thing, this whole sin problem up. Do you think that's what He has in mind? Do you think God longs to want to come and put an end to all the suffering and the pain and the sickness and the death? and the maiming, and the killing, and the robbing, and the rape. You think He wants to come and put an end to that? Yeah. Absolutely. Backing up one chapter, Jesus said, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end will come. You know, Paul believed that that had occurred in his day. Even. Paul was expecting Jesus to come in his day. But we didn't have the final element. The final element had not played out. This gospel is a definitive article. It highlights a particular gospel. Now what we're going to do is we're going to summarize it. And John the Revelator calls it the everlasting gospel to the whole world. Let's take a few moments and summarize the aspects of the gospel. It's also going to be preached in the world for a witness. What is a witness? What does that mean? Something that can be seen, something that can be realized, something testifying to the good news. If the people aren't going to do it, is God going to just allow the world? Or is He going to just wait on us? God has a timetable. Before Jesus left, He told the disciples, Basically, they teach him everything that I have commanded you. Well, we're just going to summarize that today, okay? We're going to summarize that. This aspect has already been touched on in the last service. All through the Bible from beginning to end, we see this theme of God's mercy. God gave the antediluvians 120 years of extra probation. He came down and he said, the earth is corrupt and filled with violence. But yet, Noah was living by grace. That's what it says. Noah was living by grace. Every thought of the imagination of man was only evil continually except for Noah. God in His mercy gave him the extra time. And then did lots of other things that we'll share later. Mercy and truth. We know 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise any promise. But we know that He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. But Thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion. I love this. And gracious, long-suffering, and what? Plenteous in mercy and truth. Amen? Amen. <laughs> if it wasn't for that. You know, before the flood came, there was a guy named Methuselah. 
You've heard of him before, right? What does his name mean? When he dies, it shall come. Isn't it interesting that he is the oldest recorded age in the Bible? God lingered long with that generation. The next summary, the next element of the gospel involves judgment. Revelation 14, 7. Fear God, give glory, for the hour of his judgment is come. 1 Peter, for the time is come that judgment must begin where? At the house of God. Psalms 9, 8. And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Part of the gospel message. Yeah, there's mercy, but there are also consequences. God is not arbitrary. He is going to end this problem of sin. Perseverance. He that shall endure unto the end. You know, we're all running a race, right? We're all running a race. And God tells us to endure. Don't, don't, anyone, don't let anyone ever tell you that you're a loser, that you can't make it. Do you know why? God demonstrated to you your very life is a testimony that you're a winner. you know that? I don't know if you realize that or not, but, but when you were conceived, when you were conceived, there were millions of possibilities. Guess who won? Guess who won? You did. You won. Out of millions of, 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 of contestants, you are, are the winner. You were the winner. God chose you. Don't let anyone ever tell you. But we must endure until the end. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. Pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance. Part of the good news of the Gospel. And of course, we have to put deliverance in there. Luke 4.18 Christ came to preach to the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. The Lord knows how to deliver the ungodly. Do you believe that? Amen. God knows how to deliver the ungodly. Another element, relationship. You think that's important? Relationship, a part of the gospel? God said... If you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure. Peculiar treasure unto me. In Titus, it says almost the same thing. That he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and that we might become that peculiar people zealous of good works. But he wants to go even beyond that. Yeah, he wants us to, to be the called and to accomplish a mission, but he wants to be our, our special friend. And he says, I've drawn near to you, now you draw near to me. I don't <clears throat> want you to be just a servant, but I want you to be a friend. Sacrifice. You think sacrifice is part of the good news? Absolutely. In Genesis, in Genesis 22, Abraham said, you remember the sacrifice of Isaac, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. How many really understand this text? I know it was mentioned in Sabbath school. You know the operative term in this right here is right here. God so loved the world that he gave. Gave is an interesting word in the Greek. It's the word didomi. And didomi is applicable in all three verb tenses. It applies to the past, it applies to the present, and it applies to the future. Well, that's interesting because that takes the sacrifice of Christ through eternity, through the endless ages of eternity. Now, I'll just mention this. You're not going to be able to really absorb it too, mo too well. It's going to take a little bit of time to sink in when I say this. But when the incarnation occurred, uh, we don't really talk about that too much, but that was such a pivotal aspect of this sacrifice. When Christ took on humanity, when he came out of the tomb, what did he have? A glorified body, it says in Philippians. 
What will Christ have for all eternity? We'll see it in the scar prints in His hands, in His side. He will have a glorified body. We'll have a body fashioned like His, right? But what does that mean? That means that the sacrifice to save us was an eternal one. But what did God give up? What did God sacrifice? His omnipresence? Wait, 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 wait a minute. Are you, are you there with me? God was willing to give up part of what made Him God to save us? Man, I want to run back. You know, when I first thought about that, I wanted to run back to the garden and say, no, man, no, don't do that. That's too great a price. We're not worth that. But you know what came back to me? <laughs> oh, yes, you are. Whew. Man, you're going to have to think about that one for a while, okay? You're going to have to think about that for a while. Psalm 50 and verse 5 is a, is a scripture that's, that's applicable, really, for the very last days, for the very end of time. When you read those, those first five, six verses... But in verse 5 it says, Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The work started in sacrifice. The work will continue in sacrifice. The sacrifice will extend into eternity. And then, capping it off, Victory. But thanks be to God which give us the victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. He is our victory. Amen. Now, how many of you would say that this is a, a good summation of the gospel? Mercy, judgment, perseverance, deliverance, relationship, sacrifice, and victory. Does that sound like a good summation to the gospel to you? How many, how many of you see that? Okay. Now watch what God is doing. If the stones are crying out, do you believe the stones are crying out? If the stones are crying out, what are they saying? They're saying, wake up. They're saying, get ready. I'm coming soon. Let's take a closer look. The story of Noah's Ark is really a story about mercy. Mercy. Do you know that those people were living over nine centuries? Um, we have no concept of... Uh, sorry for this, Steve. But <laughs> we have no concept of the violence and corruption that was going on before the flood. God had intended for those people to reflect His character and they'd gone completely the other way. Their minds were taken captive by sin and evil. One of the things that I picked up over there in uh, eastern Turkey, this is a, a bone that was picked up near where Mrs. Noah's grave was dug up. And of course her bones ended up going everywhere. And we'll, we'll talk about that maybe a little later. But this is a phalange bone. Does anybody know what bone that is? It's a finger bone. Look at the size of that. A finger, one of the phalange bones. It's two and a half times larger, two and a half times larger than the finger bones. I think this is the middle phalange bone. The middle phalange. Now I'm bringing this out because this person, which I believe was Mrs. Noah, because it was picked up where her grave was exhumed, robbed, would have been about 15 feet in height. Now let's see. Well, that almost be to the ceiling. Now just try to imagine, if you will, how much a person like that would weigh. Ladies, don't ever fuss about a diet or problem. I think Mrs. Noah was probably somewhere six, 7,000 pounds. But here's the thing. Two and a half times larger, 
the mass of that is incredibly uh, larger than, than what our finger bones are today. <laughs> Can you imagine the power these people had? I mean, the raw power? Probably 500 times stronger, that maybe 1,000 times stronger than we are today. And they were beating on one another? They were fighting with one another? <laughs> I can't even imagine that. But yet, you know, God said, I can't take it anymore. Isn't that what Genesis really says? It says, He came down and He said, I am grieved in my heart. I am sorry that I have ever made man. It hurts so much. He's, he's like any other parent. He's a heavenly father. And he hurts when his children hurt. Just like we do. When we see our kids going through struggles, and don't we hurt for them? Couldn't we, don't we want to step in and try to make it all better that, just like that? After 120 years of extra probationary time, God stepped in and said, I've got to bring this to an end. He stepped in in mercy. Stepped in in mercy. Sodom and Gomorrah is a story about judgment. Story about judgment. I'm not going to take these out of the bag. You can look at them later. 3,900 years ago, God rained fire down from the sky and judgment fell upon those cities of the plain. And he left us the evidence. I wonder why. He left us the evidence. Not only the sulfur, but the ash, the evidence of the burning, the salt. Everything the Bible tells us that we would find there, Ron found there. The pyramids on the Giza Plateau. And I could spend a lot of time on this. But let me just say that many people have come to the conclusion that these are simply a Bible in stone, representative of the, a representative of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. You know, um, we can take pictures of these and we can go, I don't know if anybody's ever been to Egypt, you know, you can go right up and stand on the pyramid and whatnot. If we couldn't go up and touch it and say, yeah, it's there, I see it, if somebody was just telling us about it, it's so phenomenal we wouldn't believe it ever existed. Do you know that we can't duplicate that today with all of our technology? We can't duplicate those. So that tells me that they were built pre-flood by the antediluvians. And I believe initiated by Adam himself. And we could go into a lot of that. But these are the only structures that have stood the test of time. They've been around nearly 6,000 years or more. The elements, even through the flood, and human intervention. People have broken into them. People harvested the capstones off the Great Pyramid back in the 7th century. They have stood the test of all that. It's a testimony of perseverance. And here we have the crossing of the Red Sea. I mean... Do we even have to explain that? That's about deliverance, isn't it? About deliverance. Coming out of the bondage of Egypt. Mount Sinai. Why did God take the children of Israel to Mount Sinai? Did he, did he take them there to scare them? Hey, I am God. You know, you bow to me. Now, some of them were really afraid. Some of them were shaking in their boots, I'm sure. <laughs> but he took them there to establish a special relationship with them. Ye are my people. Here's Ron himself holding the plug, the stone plug from the crucifixion site with the Ark of the Covenant below. Crucifixion site. The Ark of the Covenant. It's all about sacrifice. It's all about agape. It's all about what God was willing to do. Give up part of Himself? To, to be possibly separated from the Father for all eternity? Whew. Man, it's heavy. 
the garden tomb. And another one that we want to add to this is Gethsemane. Gethsemane and the garden tomb, we always talk about them together. You know why? Why do we talk about Gethsemane and the garden tomb together? Who can figure it out? They're close, together. They're close in proximity. They're not too far apart. But because that's where the spiritual victory over sin and death occurred and the physical victory over sin and death occurred. Man, I wish I had time to share with you about Christ's Gethsemane experience. That is an amazing, an amazing testimony of trust. Of trust. Quite incredible. We might get into it later. So what do we have here? What's going on? Here's the everlasting gospel, the summary of the gospel. Well, what do you know? The stones that are crying out are saying the exact same thing. Mercy, judgment, perseverance, deliverance, relationship, sacrifice. Isn't God amazing? Isn't He absolutely incredible? To, to recognize where we would be and say, no, I, I'm going to be with them till the end. I'm going to provide for them a tool, an asset, a resource. <laughs> Michelle, your dad was involved in something so incredible. He got it going. God has preserved and brought forth for this generation physical evidence that not only validates His Word, but proclaims the very gospel to the world. Incredible what is happening. You know all this was predicted in the Bible? All this was predicted in the Bible. Maybe in a place that, you know, you have to go through one of Lee, Lee's study examinations to get it though. You have to dig a little bit. Proverbs 9, 1-6. When you go home, maybe you can take a look at this. We'll go through a couple of high points. Wisdom had built her house. She hewn out her seven pillars. Now in the original language, the, these pillars are stone pillars. Okay, so you can see where we're going with this right away. But notice, wisdom hath killed her beast, wisdom hath mingled her wine, wisdom hath furnished her table. What's, what's going on there? In fact, first of all, who is the source of all wisdom? God is the source of all wisdom. So when we talk about God building a house, God hewing out, hewing out His seven pillars. You know, a pillar is something that not only adds beauty and symmetry to a structure, but in many cases, and particularly in Solomon's day, it was load-bearing. It supported the weight, supported the load. And that's what we find. We've got seven of these sites that God has preserved and said, we're not going to deal with them until we're going to call them back into service at the very end of time. When, when most people are forsaking the gospel, when most people are thinking that the book is just a fairy tale book, we're, we're, going, to, we're going to provide the physical evidence to show that it is real. It is authentic. I was in... Uh, and you know what? Don't for a moment think it doesn't make a difference. I was in Lowe's last year before they were getting ready to close one day. And there was a guy sweeping the floor just before we were closing. And I'm walking around and, he's, he, and he stops me and he says, Sir, is there anything I can help you find? And I said, uh, No, I'm just browsing. I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be out here in a few minutes. He said, fine. And he went on his way. I went on my way. Well, we met again in the next aisle. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when things like that happen, God kind of hits you on the head and says, this is a divine appointment. You're supposed to talk to this guy. Amen. Sometimes that happens. And... I said to him, I, I, I thought that when he asked me again, Sir, can, is there anything I can help you find? And I noticed his name badge. And I said, Say, you know, your name reminds me of the kind of research that I do. And all of a sudden he got interested. He put his hands up on his broom and he said, Yeah, what's that? And I said, Biblical archaeology. And he said, Oh, yeah. He said, what's, uh, what's the latest finds? I said, Do you know that over the last 
30 years, the remains of Noah's Ark and Sodom and Gomorrah and the Red Sea crossing. And, and I'm going on and on. And he's going, what? He said, you're kidding, right? He said, you're kidding, right? He said, he said uh, those things are real? Now, this is a college student, a college student that goes to Virginia Tech 20 minutes down the road. And he said, wait a minute, you're telling me these things are real? I said, absolutely. And he said, wow. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll bring you a paper in. I'll bring you a, a newspaper in, and you can look it up, and you can go on the website, anchorstone.com, and you can look it up for yourself and check it out. He said, man, I'm going to do that. But he said, you know what, if these things are real, he said, I really have got to re-examine my position of the church. He said, I always thought it was just a crutch. You know, they just believe that stuff to get by, you know, get through life. But now you're telling me all this is real? Tell me what his name was. What was his name? What was his name? Noah. Noah. Noah was his name. Okay. But listen, folks, let me just say this. Every day when you get up, you pray and ask God, God, send me a divine appointment today. You know, I think we need to pray for those kind of things. Send me a divine appointment. I did that just the other day, right? I got up and I said, I'm going to try this out. God, I got up and said, God, today I want to be a servant of yours. I want you to arrange for me a divine appointment. Went on my way, got my day started. Well, I had an inspector coming over to inspect the rough-in plumbing on a, on, a, on a building site that I'm working on for my son. And we'd had some problems and so forth. We did the test and we had to straighten that all out. But anyway, he got over there. And I hear this guy, you know, you can tell when you're talking to people, if they start talking about God and Jesus and this and that, you, you can pretty much gather they're, they're probably a Christian. And I said to James, I said, hey, James, you know what? You would really be interested in what I'm doing. And, and I'll tell you what, the next hour we spent talking about this, right here, all these discoveries for the next hour. He said, "Not to worry." He said, "I didn't. I didn't." He said, "I didn't even get take lunch today." He said, "Now I know why. I'm supposed to sit down with you and hear about all this." <laughs> Isn't God marvelous? God honors what He wants us to do. God is the source of all wisdom. The house is built with seven stone pillars. God is inviting people to a banquet. Did you get that? Look, wisdom has mingled the wine, provided the food, and look, even sending forth the maidens to cry upon the, what places? The highest places of the city. God wants us heard. He wants everybody to get an invitation, at least the possibility. Come. Eat of my bread, drink of my wine, which I have mingled. Forsake the foolish and live. Go on the way of understanding. Isn't that what the good news is? It's the way of understanding. It's the way to eternal life. If I were to telling you, come down to such and such a street and find the house with all the pillars. That's where you need to come. That's where the banquet is. That's where the party is. Be easy to find, wouldn't it? The seven stone pillars identify the location of where the good news can be found. <laughs> God is so absolutely amazing in what He is doing here. God knew that the world would be in a state of confusion. But our mission is still the same. To bring the world to a point of decision. That is a grave responsibility. A grave responsibility. To assist in the endeavor, God has provided some tools, some evidence that we can use. How many of you need to see a piece of petrified wood from, from the remains of the ark with pitch on it? How many of you need to see that to believe the story? Let me see your hands. We don't need to believe this, do we? We don't need to see this to believe the story because... We believe the story by faith, don't we? Amen. Okay. But God has provided all of this as an asset, as a tool for us to use because He knew 
where we would be in our spiritual condition. And he said, I want to help them out. I want to give them some help. I'm going to provide them with some tools to take the gospel to the world. And so he has done that. What does that tell us? What does that reveal to us? We are right at the end. We are right at the end. Don't be planning for 10, 20 years out. Forget that. We're at the end. The end is not near. The end is here. And God is demonstrating that. So we're looking at 30 squares now, aren't we? We're looking at 30 squares. Here's our last verse. God reminds us through Timothy that the church, that we are the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. We are the pillar and the ground of the truth. That's what you are. But you know what? We, we have faded a bit, haven't we? You know, I, I used to hear people saying all the time, those folks are the people of the Bible. I know when I would go through town sometimes, I would see folks, some of our, our Baptist brethren or, or Methodist brethren going to church. And you know what was really all too obvious? I never saw anybody carrying a Bible. And I thought to myself, Man, we are the people of the Bible, the people of the Word. Are we really? We have faded a bit, haven't we? We have lost that first love. God is providing us something to say, you know what, this is where you used to be. This is where you used to be. The time is of the essence. The enemy is, is pulling out all the stops. Don't you see that, right? You heard that earlier today. God's not on the sideline. He's in the game. He's at the helm. He is the quarterback. He is ready to march his team down the field to victory. We just need to give him half a chance. God is always way ahead of us. You know that, don't you? He's always way ahead of us. Uh, <clears throat> We believe that God has provided these evidences as a tool to assist in our mission to reach the world. He caused these sites to be rediscovered for us, for this last generation. Michelle, that's what your dad began. That's what he started. That's what. Yeah. Praise God that he was faithful in that endeavor. This is not about, though, this is not about what's happening. It's not about a person. It's not about any organization. In fact, it's not even about archaeology. Right? It's about what God is doing to help us in finishing the work. Absolutely. To finish the Great Commission. He knew that it would be necessary. Now look, 1,500 years before the children of Israel got to Nueva, the beach, to cross the Gulf of Aqaba, 1,500 years earlier, God had already put the bridge there. But nobody could see it. It was invisible. It's under the water. But he put it there 1,500 years so that when they got there, he just had to dust the water off of there and they'd be able to walk across. God is always way ahead of us. 600 years before Jesus Christ hung outside the north gate of the city of Jerusalem, God said to Jeremiah, you take the sanctuary furniture and you put it right there. So that when I call it into service again, it will be ready. God is always way ahead of us. It was invisible for 600 years. It was out of sight, wasn't it? The ark, Noah's ark, Buried under the mud, out of sight for who knows how long, how many centuries. Fossilizing, becoming one of the stones that God would use to raise up right now. This had to happen that way. If you understand the atonement, you know we're people of the sanctuary, right? We understand the sanctuary. We're experts in the sanctuary. 
And yet we have missed this. This is the rest of the story. We have missed this. When the priest would take and collect the blood at the altar sacrifice, what would he do with it? Throw it over his shoulder? Like grains of salt? No way. He would take it into the holy place, right? And he would apply the blood in the holy place. Why why can't we believe that that's what happened in reality? If that's what happened every day and every year with sanctuary service. Now, of course, they would just take a portion of the blood. Do you know what happened to the majority of the blood? What did they do? What did the priest do with the majority of the blood? Poured it into the ground at the base of the altar. Voila. That is exactly what took place. The blood went into the ground at the base of the altar. But you know, some people say, well, if you believe that, then you must think that the soldier that pierced Christ in the side, that he was our Savior. I've heard that criticism before, particularly in Australia. But again, only looking at 16 squares, when we look a little deeper, we find out that, wait a minute, why did they nail Jesus to the cross? What's up with the crown of thorns, anyway? I mean, is that just a a way to torture the Son of God? When you go back to Exodus 29, Leviticus 8, you find two parallel chapters. They're talking about the qualifying anointings for priestly ministry. Someone tell me here why Christ was baptized. Why was Jesus baptized, do you think? He was an example. <laughs> the first anointing that Aaron and his sons went through, they went to the sanctuary and they were washed. Jesus, of course, that was an example, but what did Jesus say? He was there to fulfill all righteousness. And he was there being washed as the first anointing for priestly qualification. You know that there are seven of those. Oil. Not only the water, but the oil. Blood on the head and the hands and the feet. You see, they wouldn't have nailed him up there knowing that in just a couple hours the Sabbath was going to be coming along. No way. Because crucifixion sometimes took took days. Now they would come along and break the legs to speed things up, or they would break their legs, take them down, set them by the cross, and then after Sabbath they'd put them back up. Nice guys, huh? But when they got to Jesus, they saw that he already had been, he'd already laid down his life. But he'd already gone through all of the anointings for priestly ministry. And when the soldier pierced him in the side, Christ made the application of the blood onto the mercy seat below. Why do you think there was an earthquake that rent the rocks? that split the rocks apart. Because God knew, hey, and it's an easy thing for him, right? We need access down there. We need access to the the mercy seat below. Why did did Christ's blood have to go on the mercy seat? It had to pay the price. In other words, when Christ, in Matthew, he says, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill and Christ, Christ paid the demands of the law, didn't he? His blood, with his own blood, satisfied the demands of the law. Now why did he have to do that? He had to ratify the covenant with his own blood. He had to satisfy the demands of the law with his own blood if, if there was any chance of a resurrection. Do you know that if that blood had not gone on the mercy seat, the resurrection could not have legally occurred? That's the rest of the story that we missed out on somewhere along the way. You go back in 1 John. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three agree in one. There are three that bear witness in earth. 
the blood, the water, and the spirit. And these, these, these three agree in one. Who was it that took the information that Christ had paid the price, that the price was paid in full? Who took that to the Father? Read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. It was the Spirit that took it there. Amen, Amen brother. You see what was happening? All of this is biblical insight. All of these are the stones that are crying out. Well, where does that leave us? What are we going to do with this? This ought to be such great encouragement to us. Amen. That God is willing to, to, to take matters into His own hands and help us in this significant way. That ought to be great encouragement to us. The Bible tells us, I am with you always. You see? So I praise God for all of this. I praise God for this. This evening we'll look at a lot of the physical evidence through the videos and we'll take your questions and answers. But let me say, folks, <laughs> please, please realize we are, the hours of probationary time are ticking away. Ticking away. So let's, uh, let's get busy. Let's join our voices with the voices of the stones. Let's, let's get the work done. God has called us for such a time as this. It's not going, to be, not going to be pleasant. But you know what? You wouldn't be here if God didn't know that you couldn't handle it. You wouldn't be here. So praise God for that. Let's stand and we'll just have a quick word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your, your wonderful plan. Lord, you, you, you know that we're just but, but dust. You know that we need you every moment of the day. Father, we just want to throw ourselves at the foot of the altar. Let us put our house in order. Let us stand solely on your word. Lord, we can see all these things coming together. We know the end is near. Please, use us in the finishing of your work. And thank you for all of your help. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.